Okay, folks, so I now get to tell you a bit about, I heard the question of computational modeling, and that is essentially a big part of this talk here. So I'm going to try to tell you about another aspect of things going on in the department, another one of these impact areas. So you'll have a, little, a half hour for me and questions, and then we'll get a break. Is everybody hanging in there? Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, I titled the name of this talk, Reverse Engineering the Mind, and I'm going to try to use my time here to tell you a bit of history that's happened around modeling and its relationship to the brain and through work in my own lab particularly. And then I'll try to highlight at the end how we think there's a broader uh, possibility set here going on within the department and give you a sense of where that is heading in the department. So this is a reminder of what I told you in my introduction, that we think of the brain as some kind of computing device, just not like any that we've built before. And it's this way of thinking about the brain as a complex information processor and trying to build things in engineering terms or describe it in engineering terms to really say we understand it, not just measure the phenomenology, but to understand these interactions in a way that we could simulate them or know how to intervene in one level to cause changes in another. That's really what these efforts are after, is building deep understanding of a complex system using models that are likely to be very complex as well. Um, again, not like any system that we've built before, but amazing in its power. Again, three pounds, just 20 watts. Um, those are amazing uh, capabilities that somehow we, we have the opportunity to try to discover how it is that it actually gives rise to everything that's us. So I want to highlight, I showed you this slide earlier, that our mission is here, reverse engineer the mechanisms of the mind. And you, you heard about from Bob um, on the impact on disorders of the mind. So a deep understanding of genetic, molecular, and structural underpinnings of brain diseases is needed to develop preventative measures and treatments. And you heard that, I think, very well in Bob's talk. Um, and I mentioned these other impact areas in the department. You heard some about tools from Bob. And you'll hear more about this in the lightning talks. I want to focus your attention up here in this intelligence and cognitive computing impact area. One of the things we like to say is that the science of biological intelligence, understanding how the brain gives rise to intelligent behavior, is we think the foundation of next generation artificial intelligence systems to work alongside of us. Now, I don't want you to think that this is really just a one-way street. In fact, um, what, what really, in my mind, is happening is that this is a very fruitful interactive street at the moment. And I think that's going to continue for a very long time because the frontier of our field really now is building neural network models at scales, building models of these different levels of phenomenology to begin to understand, again, how one gives rise to the other, going beyond describing the phenomenology but building models. Once you're able to build models, they have immediate translational impact into potential AI systems. Similarly, hypotheses are things that are built from the AI community that are in net neural network framing our hypotheses about things that might be going on within the brain. And so this is a very interactive two-way street, and there's not a wall between here, and this is a very exciting area for the department right now. And broadly, that interaction fueling what I call understanding accelerates all of these other things, because ultimately, as the question came up a moment ago, even these things here, to understand its orders of the mind, we're going to benefit greatly if we can understand the computations that are giving rise to, say, social behavior or hallucinations and schizophrenia. Those are things that we don't understand at a, at a mechanistic, at a kind of model-based sense. So I want to focus you here, but remind you that it's driving all of our mission. So here's a a kind of general framing that the problem of biological intelligence, the intelligence that we all think we share, how the brain generates it and how it could be replicated in machines, which you would loosely call artificial intelligence, is arguably the most important open problem in science today. Um, there's, there's two forms of this, why I think this is the most important open problem. One is the one I just described for you, that it fuels the rest of our understanding of how the brain works in a model-based sense. There's a longer term perspective that my colleague Tommy Poggio likes to point out, that if we can build intelligent systems, then that's sort of the problem to end all problems, because those problem, that system then becomes, does a lot of the work that we are trying to do here on the ground. That's a very long term view. In the more shorter term view, what we're after is to try to build models that can actually interface with our understanding of how the brain works. And again, these things, I think, are both synergistic along the same broader, larger pathway. And the way to think about this is that you know, computer, you generally think of technology of intelligence like AI technologies being driven somehow out of computer science. 
But the story I want you to understand is that a lot of the recent advances in technology of intelligence have come from a deeper understanding of science of parts of intelligence through work in cognitive science and neuroscience. And I'm going to try to illustrate that for you using some of my own work and others in the department in a moment. Progress is resulting from this convergence. Our department, we think, has a unique role to play in this progress. Why do we have a unique role? Well, as I mentioned in the introduction, we are anchored in behavioral perspective. And ultimately, intelligence is about the ability to successfully behave in the world. It's not all about just the mechanisms of the brain, but it's how they give rise to functionally appropriate behavior. And we're at MIT. This is the other reason that we think we're unique. Although there are many neuroscience departments or cognitive science departments in the world, at MIT we take a particular perspective in that we want to build models in engineering and computer science terms, and that imbues much of our research. That is, the answers that we expect from our, our, our work is not just phenomenology, but answers in the language of engineering and computing, models that can be built to be predictive. So I, just to focus you on intelligence, so I'm talking about I'm talking about AI and intelligence very broadly, and I'll, I'll sort of sort of segue here to say intelligence. I might you might think of as really the sort of foundation of the mind. It's sort of one of the things that unifies or what we call the mind. It has many facets. So one of the things that you, many of the facets are listed here, and this is not all of them. So how we visually comprehend the world, how we do audio and speech comprehension and processing, how we can navigate and route plan, how we can make decisions, how we can model other minds, which is the basis of social behavior, and being able to do these things from limited data, to learn from just a little bit of data that humans seem to do. These are the kind of things that, that our biological system, our brain does quite well, yet have been challenging for artificial systems to do. So I'm not going to talk about all these. I'll highlight some of them at the, at the end. But what I want to tell you now is a story of some recent success story about just one of these facets. So I'm telling you this story to give you a sense of what's happened in the last decade or so so that you can understand how we imagine things growing forward in the future. So this story, for me, begins with work on visual processing. So human minds have strong perception. When you look at this scene, you're able to digest and compute a lot of things in this scene that are really, this is just a pattern of little light pixels being red, green, or blue. But you're able to infer a lot of latent content in this scene. For instance, knowing that this is a car, and this is a person, and this is a, a path, but you might not want to go that way. You might want to be over here. Um, these are the kind of things that you can instantly compute, or seemingly instantly compute, that we'd like to understand how you're able to do that. And so what my lab focused on was a more reduced problem, not the whole problem, but just trying to understand object detection and categorization. As I alluded to earlier, just being able to say, this is a car, this is a person, this is a building, this is a tree. Um, that problem was the problem that I came here to work on when I started my lab at MIT. And one of the things that we knew that brain and cognitive science had already told us is that your brain doesn't really process that whole image at once. Now, you may all have the sense somehow that image comes in and you know everything about it. But in fact, you have high acuity where you're looking, so the center of gaze. This is what we think of as the central 10 degrees if you hold your two hands out at arm's length. That's about your center of 10, 10 degree visual field where you have high acuity processing. Now, you don't just, of course, look at just this one spot, but you make movements to sample the scene. You're not aware of your do doing this. Bob mentioned monkeys making eye movements. This is something that primates like us do all the time, several times a second. We don't notice that we're doing it. So for instance, you might have looked right here when I flashed up this slide, but you quickly made saccades unbeknownst to yourself, or you didn't really feel them, but you're sampling the scene, like some, something that might look like this. So you might dwell here, you move quickly here. You don't really see when you're moving. You see when you're stopped. So you kind of stick here for a couple hundred milliseconds and you sample around. Now what this does is it brings to what you see in the world something that looks like this. So you might see a series of snapshots like that when you sample the path. Now what I wanted you to notice, did you notice you could recognize an object or something in each and one of those images? Did everybody feel that? Let me try it again. So you can see like a person or a sign or even though I didn't, now I took it out of context, right? I'm just showing you these flash glimpses, right? And this highlights something that we call core object perception, that you can do a lot with just the central 10 degrees in just a couple hundred milliseconds, which is what, 0.2 seconds. So it's sort of literally like a blink of an eye. So just a very fractional part of a second, which is what I'm showing you there. And um, what we have been focused on, this started in, in when I came here to MIT, was to try to reverse engineer that problem. So not reverse engineer the entire mind, not to reverse engineer all of intelligence, but to reverse engineer that particular problem and try to build models around that as a stepping stone to these more challenging problems. 
So when you're going to do any kind of reverse engineering, the way I think about this and the way I think many of us in the department think about reverse engineering is that you first want to especially look at where do currently engineered systems fall down or where do they fall short relative to biological brains. Which, and then if you know that, you also want to ask, well, what if I can measure parts of the brain, various different things, behavior, blood flow, genes, neural activity, what should I maybe measure to inform on how to build an engineering system to do better? And then you want to actually try to use those measurements to constrain what is essentially forward engineering or hypothesis building, building models constrained by this kind of knowledge. And then this is the loop that you follow for whatever problem that you're focused on. And I'll try to show you how we followed this loop for this problem of core object perception as an example of how we in the department are using this philosophy to drive on other problems. So let's talk about where do currently engineered systems fall down relative to humans relative on this particular problem of core perception. Now this actually, I see, even though I said I was only going to talk about the last decade, this goes back several decades to our own Molly Potter's work here in the department who's recently retired. But Molly showed, one of the things she showed is the amazing power of humans to do what I just showed each of you. And she studied this in great detail, your ability to recognize objects even with brief glimpses. And one of the things that Molly is known for, these are called rapid serial visual presentations. Again, this is very analogous to what I just showed you. I hope that you notice that you can recognize one or more objects in each and every one of those images, even though they're coming by very, very quickly. right? And I didn't give you cues of what kinds of things that you'd see, and yet you're still able to do it very easily. Everybody likes to laugh at Yoda. I don't <laughs> I don't know why. Anyway, so one of the things that we figured out and that Molly and others helped to point, figure out is that you know, the brain, the, your ability to do this here, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to have a demo. Let me try it again. This is actually kind of testing that we do in the lab for both monkeys and humans just to give you a feel. So you can kind of try to maybe shout out what you see. It's, it's a little bit fun. So you're gonna, I'm not even going to tell you the object categories, but let's see if you can do it. Car. It was kind of weird, though. It was like floating in air, right? Yet you still could say it was a car. That was a hard one. Anybody see? It was a plane. Yeah. Lots of cars. OK, so you get, you know, those are just, I don't know, my grad student gave me a few images a while ago, and those I'm stuck with them. But you get, the, you get the idea that you can easily be able to say, hey, that's a car. And what we do, each of you just did immediately, but machines found challenging when we started this work, is that you're dealing with lots of images of cars. So you never see the exact image of a car twice. You see the cars under different viewpoints, different changes in its position, size, and pose, and the illumination on the car. You see change, different, there might be different types of cars that you still want to call a car, different kinds of background, some of it potentially occluding. Yet somehow you look through all this and still say it's a car. And way back when we started, now this is actually data from 2009, so it was even later, um, you could show easily that humans could beat current computer vision systems at being able to, to say that it was a car, not when things were very standardized. If you always see a car from a side view, for instance, in the center, and it's a certain type of car, then machines actually could beat humans. But humans were able to generalize to these high uncertainties that you just did that say, I don't know how this car is going to look, but I can still tell that it's a car. That's called high view uncertainty. And that's what we're showing here quantified. Here's a bunch of human observers. Here was state-of-the-art computer vision performance around 2009 on these tasks. And it was like doing well here, but quickly was falling apart at these kind of high variation conditions. So, so that was kind of known to be part of the problem. But then how do we look back to the brain to say, how does the brain help, help us to understand how to build a better system to solve these problems? Well, first we have to know where to look in the brain. And here work from like Nancy Kamwisher, one of the faculty members in our department. She and others helped to highlight, figure out using tools like brain imaging in humans first, and later with colleagues like my colleague Doris Sow, being able to show where these, uh, uh, where these kind of, um, uh, Im where the parts of the brain are that are involved in processing. In this case, it's processing faces in particular. But other parts of the brain involved in processing more general objects, including things like bodies or places, these were the kind of things that Nancy and others helped to point us to the brain regions that are involved. So this kind of work highlighting the brain regions gives us kind of a kind of guidepost of don't look over the whole brain, but there's certain regions of the brain that are involved. And then now this is me when I had more hair and less gray. Um, uh, and I came here in 2002 as an assistant professor. And what I came here to do was to try to say, well, we know about these brain regions that I'll show you in a minute. Could we study the neurons in more detail to get some clues as to how they actually drive this kind of behavior? So I was trying to go down here, given past knowledge, what we could look at at this deeper, this sort of more fine-grained spatial level to understand at higher spatial and temporal resolution what was going on. 
So of course, we all want to understand this brain. This is, the, this is the human brain that I introduced you to that we, of course, all want to understand. But my lab chose to work on this brain. This is the rhesus monkey, not shown exactly to scale. And part of the reason we chose to work on the monkey is that even though there was at work in humans, we still knew much more about the homologous areas in the monkey. The series of visual areas that processes to object recognition were known here. And they're called the ventral visual stream. There's a series of areas called B1, B2, B4, and IT in the cortical part of the brain. And I'll show you those again in a minute. So we knew where the computations were. We just didn't know how they were working. We also, so we knew the system anatomy, of course, great. We kind of knew who's connected to who grossly, not at fine detail, but grossly what areas are connected to which. And we knew that these areas were involved in connection to areas of the brain that are implicated in decision and memory, the decision and action into memory. So we had kind of a rough lay of the land. And we had models based on prior work of elementary computations going on within local cortical regions, each of these cortical regions. But we didn't know how the system worked together as a whole. And because this is a non-human primate and not a human, though, we could access it at much higher spatial and temporal resolution. And you can use some of the tools that you heard about from Bob to be able to manipulate neural activity, for instance, using optogenetics, which didn't exist when we started, but now is possible for us to be able to move the neurons around in a monkey that's not yet possible in a human. So this is all the reasons we use this animal model. These are many of them. Now, you might say, well, why aren't you using a mouse? And Bob's already sort of alluded to that. A monkey has much different behavior, much more like our own than a mouse. I mean, I can illustrate that a bit for you here. This is a non-human primate working in one of its, um, working in the lab on one of what's just like a video game for it that gets a juice reward for doing the task that you just did. You're basically clicking a button to start an image. When he sees the image, he then makes a choice about which object that he sees, and that's what he's pressing with a touchpad here. Okay, so the monkeys love to do this kind of behavior. They're very visual creatures. They do very well at it. In fact, it's not just that they do well at it. If you compare monkeys and humans, <laughs> <laughs> I guess you guys already know the punchline here, right? <laughs> They're almost identical in their performance patterns, OK? So um, you might be like, wow, it's a monkey. How does a monkey can do that? Um, well, I mean, really what they're doing is identifying shapes. The monkey, I'm pretty sure, doesn't know that it could get and drive the car away or it doesn't know what a gun does. Um, yet it's able to discriminate the kind of images that you saw into different categories based on just a little bit of training. It takes about a day for an animal to learn a new object. And then it behaves at essentially near human levels. And that's what's shown here. The pattern of colors means even humans find some things hard to discriminate than others. And that makes sense. You know, you know, uh, car, or cars and trucks are very similar to each other. And you make more errors when I show you an image of a car or truck than if I say, was it a car or a zebra? And that's what you're seeing in these colors here. But so you see the patterns of errors. And the absolute values are very, very similar in both humans and monkeys. In fact, when we did this study, humans and, and non-human primates were almost essentially indistinguishable for these kind of core object categorization tasks. And so what that means is if we could understand the circuits of this task, then we would have essentially, we think, a very good model of what's going on in each of our brains, at least around this aspect of intelligence. So now, as I said, we can access this system, the ventral visual stream. It's a series of these cortical areas, again, V1, V2, V4, and IT. And as engineers, like, think of this is like tissue that had to be curled up and folded up inside the skull. Here I'm laying them out to you, and there's sort of millions of neurons that are similar, sort of sketched schematically along here, just to give you a sense of this. And the rough lay of the land anatomy that I told you, you have sort of forward connections, you have backward connections, you have intracortical connections of this type. There's other connections in the brain, some of which I mentioned earlier, that aren't on this slide. But these are the kind of dominant connections through these cortical areas. And this together is called, again, the ventral visual stream. So what happens when an image comes into this system? It, kind of, it hits the back of your retina. It's transformed into neural activity. It's what's called the retinal ganglion cell layer. So essentially a nice photographic copy, something a nice camera would do. Um, and then it's, it's now kind of modeled as a, an image across a population of neurons in the back of your eye. And then it's transformed into the middle of your brain and the LGN, and then through successive population patterns of activity along the stream, roughly in this way where you have successive lags of about 10 milliseconds of processing at each level. So it takes about 100 milliseconds. Most of the lags are up front here on the camera capture. It takes about 100 milliseconds to get a new population pattern of activity in IT cortex here, this place I'll say more about in a minute. IT stands for infratemporal cortex. And what I want you to know is that each image produces a new population pattern that I've schematized here with these red dots. So, so this image might show this is just a schematic, might produce this population pattern of activity. This is not a photograph. It's not just copying a photograph here. It's some sort of new pattern of neural activity that 
that is evoked by this image. And a new image evokes a new population pattern. And when you were watching that RSVP of Molly's work that I showed you earlier, we have something clicking along in your homolog of IT, a population pattern at a lag of about 100 milliseconds. So your, follow, your brain is following along and producing a new pattern of activity. Now, why am I telling you about this? These patterns turned out to be remarkably powerful. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But these sort of turned out to be the solution to how the brain solves the problem. The information about the content of the image are actually easy to find in these population patterns, but very difficult to find in these, popula these early population patterns. So, but when we started this work, when my lab began, we didn't really have an engineering specification of this transformation that I've schematized for you. We kind of, again, knew the lay of the land and some phenomenology. But we didn't have a model of what was going on. And we also didn't know the thing I just told you. We didn't know how the, the neural activity here related to the animal's perception and its behavior. And so that's, that, was kind of, that was about where we started about 15 years ago. And to summarize that back to this big picture, even though we had kind of started to work on studying these neurons and we weren't the first lab in here, other labs are doing this as well, um, we didn't really have a link. You know, what was missing here is some models that can intervene between the phenomenology and this behavior at this higher level. So we didn't have that, but that was our goal, was to build all that. So when we started, we would record from neurons in IT cortex. And I'm showing you this slide just so you can get a sense of what neurons look like when you listen to them. The neurons communicate with other neurons through what are called action potentials or spikes. And those are shown here for these are three example recordings out of IT cortex. So these are three different neurons responding to five different images here. And you see the little spikes that they're sending out in response to this image. These, each row is a repeated presentation. All I want you to see is different sites like different images. So this site likes these and not so much these. See more spikes, less spikes. And you also see that different sites, it's not like all the sites are doing the same thing. And if you can imagine an entire population, that's how you imagine this picture where each image gives rise to an entirely new set of neural activity when it's, when it's presented. And this is showing you kind of the core data. So I'm not going to take you through the details of all the analysis that went on, but after a lot of work on collecting these kind of data, we, and when I say we, I mean my colleagues in particular, Tommy Poggio, my collaborator in the department when we started this work, um, we discovered how the brain codes information about objects in IT. So we were able to build models that could take us from these population vectors with a simple linear transformation to get to variables of the mind, to be able to predict what the animal was going to say um, for, each, for each image, whether it would say it's a car or it's a face, and to, to also model the, uh, the pattern of errors that the animal produces. And this work still is ongoing today in terms of working out the details of how, what intervenes between this uh, population and the final behavior. But at that point, we had realized that actually most of the action had been solved at this point around this problem, and that it turned us from not so much understanding the downstream mechanisms, which again, we continue to work on, but to these sort of more upstream mechanisms that I've skipped over. That after we understood that IT population activity could explain the animal's behavior, what became mysterious is that these neural responses, even though we can measure them, we didn't have models, again, that would take us from any image and predict the neural responses of IT. So these were very mysterious responses. People had recorded them before. They knew they were mysterious. We now linked them to the behavior tightly, but we needed to now understand how do you go from the image to these. So, so to put that in perspective, the way we think about this is the brain's solution to uh, intelligent sensing on this core object perception task is conveyed in this population activity somehow up here. But again, we didn't have any specification or engineering model of how you go from an image to that. We just could observe that and say, oh, it's easy to build a model from here to behavior. But building a model from there to there was hard. OK, so that was where we were. And now I don't want you to know all the details of this. I don't want you to take, worry about all these words here. All I want you to know from this is that there were a lot of data. And I don't mean to imply my lab by far wasn't the only lab contributing. Many labs were contributing data as to the kind of things that were going on both in anatomy and in physiology along these different levels of visual processing. And some of the kind of, kind of things that we had learned from brain science are listed in, in sort of summary form here. And so we knew all that. And that, those kind of constraints were being used in parallel even before I started. This is way back in 1980 to begin to build models that were modeled off of the structure that had been learned about the anatomy. So these were early models of what might be going along here. This was an early model by Fukushima called the Neocognitron. Then later, uh, my colleague Tommy Poggio here in the department built a, a series of models called the HMAX class of models that advanced over those models and its ability to predict what was going on. Then my lab picked up the ball and started building even more um, advanced models. And then in 2012, 
Um, a postdoc and a grad student in my lab built this model that we called HMO, which again, you can see all these models, they look the same. They have these kind of repeating structures at different levels. And they actually share a lot of details. And I'd be happy to tell you the stories of what was evolving along those models. But just take in mind that there's a model here that's an approximation of what's going on that we called HMO. And what was so striking to us is that this model, when we built it, it, it's high levels, if I, could, oh, if I could back up and go forward again, it's high levels right up here, these kind of high intermediate levels. So behavior happens out here in the model. These are simulated neurons in the model here. If we looked at simulated neurons at these levels up here, they started to explain what we were observing in IT cortex. So just to give you a feel for that, these are images along here. This black is the, res this is the response of neurons to um, different images, and you see it going up and down. So this IT neuron likes different images, kind of like that example I showed you for just five images. Here there's thousands of images being collected, and here's a few examples shown here. And what I want you to see is the red is the prediction of a model of what this neuron should be doing for all these images, and these are predictions. The model didn't get to see these images. It had to predict what the IT neuron would do. So these are not fits to the data. Yet you can see how good this is. It's not perfect. We can quantify that here. But it was a huge advance over things that we had previously had in our ability to explain these neurons. It's not just neurons that like this neuron tended to respond more to faces, but not all faces. This neuron kind of likes chairs. But again, you shouldn't think of these neurons as being categorical. They support categorical perception, but they're not themselves categorical. And you can see that you know, even though the neurons have words that are hard to put in human terms, the models are able to predict their responses quite well. So the summary of all this, I already said this. These are not fits. You should not think, oh, we're just taking a bunch of parameters and fitting data. These are predictions of a, of a model that was built and fit on com other, completely other data to be happy to tell you about. This, but this neural network model, what we had now, we thought, was a model that captured a lot of the processing. It seemed to be working the way the brain was working because it gave the same phenomenology that we are observing that was previously not understood. So this was a big advance for us that was happening around 2012 within the lab. And then what happened is right at 2012, this group came out. This is um, Jeff Hinton's group at Toronto, came up with this model, which was an extension of these class of models that you'd already been seeing. And there's a whole story about how they came up with this model. But this model was entered into the ImageNet challenge that had previously been dominated by completely other forms of models. This model won the ImageNet challenge by a long shot in 2012. So suddenly, these class of models called deep neural networks, that, that's what they're now called, essentially took over um, the computer vision community in terms of, wow, this is way better than anything we'd been using before. And that became the dominant model of the field in, in computer vision and other things well beyond that point. In fact, in 2012, this was a New York Times article, Science He Promised in Deep Learning Programs. They were talking about these kind of deep convolutional neural networks that I just showed you that Jeff Hinton's group and others had built based on theories about how the brain recognizes patterns that I gave you a lot of the background as to where that class of models came from. And so what we had was in 2012, a breakthrough in biologically constrained AI that people get excited about. Now all of you probably can't walk around without hearing about deep learning. So what deep learning is referring to is essentially ways to learn on these kind of deep models that I just showed you here. And I'd be happy to talk more about this in questions, but there's many engineering details behind those models. But the big picture to give you back is that this wasn't just a one-way street. It wasn't just biology helping to shape a class of models that ultimately became the leading models in this area of AI. It was also that, that the, these models, as I already told you, help to inform what's going on in the brain. So remember that two-way street I said at the beginning. So now we had, you know, in 2013, we published those results that I showed you with our HMO model. And then that we found that these models actually were able to explain the neurons quite well, just as I showed you a few slides ago. So Dan Yamans, my postdoc, and I showed this, and that now we actually had models that could begin to explain the things that were previously mysterious. And interestingly, even some of the more advanced computer vision models that we didn't build, but that were built in the same flavor, were able to predict our neurons even better than some of the models that we had built. So this line of work continues today, but there's this exciting interplay between models in both directions here. So just to give you a summary, we were missing this link. Tommy Pojo in our department helped kind of build the foundation of this. And then Jeff, Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun, these were two of the now the kind of, they're known as the folks that have really pushed this deep neural network revolution. Um, they were actually psychologists and neural network people. They stuck with the brain constraints and always believed this would work. And again, through the combination of these kind of efforts, we now had uh, uh, this, this, this bridge between systems of neurons and brain regions all the way up in behavior and cognition because now we had models that could link across these different levels. And so the summary of all this I'd like to leave you with is that 
We saw a dramatic advance in visual AI in this narrow domain so far. But we also saw a dramatic advance in our understanding of one facet of biological intelligence. So these kind of things are interplaying with each other, as I tried to describe for you a minute ago. They play off of each other. So where are we now? So what's the, what's the future look like? So this is like, this tells you something about kind of, wow, there's been these great breakthroughs in visual processing. You've heard about many of them in the field. You can read about them in the newspaper. And so here's a, here's a recent article from the New York Times. Recent advances, while impressive, have been mainly in image recognition. The next frontier research agrees is general visual knowledge. Remember, I said visual comprehension. The development hours that cannot understand not just objects, which is what I was showing you, but also actions and behaviors. Computing intelligence often seems to mimic human intelligence. Researchers offer two analogies to describing the promising paths ahead. Analogies to a child and a brain. So far, I've been child referring to the development process and brain referring to measuring the, the mechanisms of the brain in the adult state, much of which I, is what I've showed you in my talk. BCS faculty are actually pursuing both of these. I showed you my own work, and I'll try to highlight a bit of the other work here in a minute. So I want to kind of point out for you, though, we're really at the beginning. So far in my lab and others, we've only modeled this sort of feed forward part of the brain. Um, that's what we modeled so far that I've been describing as these models. Um, we, we, but now we can still see, even though, you know, despite the New York Times saying, oh, that problem is solved, the problem is far from solved. We can still see the brain is way better than artificial systems on many of these images. That's what's shown here in red, us testing many images against state-of-the-art models, even these models built off of this feed-forward approximation. And the difference, we think, is that the models don't have these other parts of the brain that we, we have a lot of evidence to suggest the kind of feedback processes are involved in the performance gains that the model, the humans have and monkeys have over these kind of models. So that's where my work is heading now is the even more advanced models based, again, following the brain, continuing to push that line of work. So, but I want to say a few words. I've told you a lot about visual comprehension. I'd like to say a few words about some of these other things to give you a feel of what else the department is doing in this area. So let's talk about audio and visual speech, comp audio and speech comprehension. This is Josh McDermott. Josh is going to run a lightning session later this afternoon, so you'll get to hear more about this. But Josh's group is really leading an effort on trying to understand how the brain processes auditory signals. This is an example of models that they are building. They look very similar to the models that I showed you. And that's because cortex around auditory processing looks very similar to cortex around visual processing. It's just the details vary in interesting ways. So the same family of architectures is being used. These are deep convolutional neural nets that are approximating what's going on. And what Josh, what Josh has showed in his group is that they can train models to do answer tasks like which word did you hear, which music were you listening to. And those models provide an understanding of the activity patterns observed that were previously phenomenological in human brains measured with fMRI. And I think Josh and his student Alex Kell will tell you more about that in the lightning talks. So this is now trying to push the same ideas into auditory processing. And this is just one aspect of Josh's work that the department is, that is excited about. I want to mention, I've already mentioned several times my colleague Tommy Poggio, who is a theorist and a model builder who's been the foundation of many of this, much of this work. Tommy will point out that even though we have these deep neural network models, we still don't deeply understand them at a theoretical level. His group has done a lot of work and is continuing work to understand how these models are able to perform so well, why deep networks perform better than shallow networks. And, um, and uh, that I could tell you stories about that if you're interested, why they're able to generalize so well. It's very surprising these models have many parameters, yet they're still able to learn from still a large amount of training data, but then they still generalize in a way that's surprising given previous ideas from statistics and how you need to train models. And that's something that Tommy's lab is actively working on. I want to end with this slide here um, from Josh Tenenbaum's group. So Josh. Tenenbaum is a, a professor in our department, a professor of cognitive science. Josh has done a, a tremendous amount of work to move the fields of AI and machine intelligence forward. Here's a ex recent example of Josh's work on, uh, this was published in Science about a year and a half ago, uh, where they built a system where they were able to have a system learn from just a few training examples. Remember I mentioned earlier, it's hard for humans to, hard for machines to learn from a few training examples. It's sometimes called one-shot learning or small number of examples learning. You know, Josh was able to build a system that could do this within a limited domain, not just learn from a few examples, but to generate other examples from that learning, to be able to construct new characters from new character sets that they had learned from a few examples, construct them in a way that would fool humans so that other humans couldn't tell whether Josh's system or another human had generated those characters. So it had kind of passed one of the Turing tests that we put up against models to say, how are they doing? 
If you're interested in this work, I'm sure I'd be happy to say more. Josh can tell you more about that. The frontier that Josh and his lab are pushing on is to understand, I mentioned the kids earlier, how even children can have an intuitive sense of physics, not just that there are blocks here, but what way they're likely to fall down, what's stable, what's stable, what's not stable. And even more deeply, how they do sort of theory of mind and in kind of what we call common sense and being helpful or not. And the, being able to build artificial systems that can kind of interact with agents and know what it means to be helpful is one of the hardest problems in artificial intelligence. And it's one of the problems that Josh's lab is working on. I want to sort of show you a video. This is from Wernicke and Tomasello. Just watch this for a minute. Oh. That's an 18 month old. So even, you may think, you may hear AI is going to take over. AI doesn't do anything like that yet, right? And that's an 18-month-old, right? So one of the goals of Josh and his lab and the, is to understand how, what's going on inside that 18-month-old brain in terms of engineering terms that you could imagine having a flexible, intelligent, cooperative robot just as that 18-month-old is able to do. So there are amazing things that kids do that we can study, that we do study about how they do it. And then Josh and his team try to build models of how they might be executing that. And those models, we think, can be the foundation, not just of today's AI around things like vision and so forth that I showed you, but about the next generation of AI. So that's a really a quite exciting frontier for us. I hope you can see that there's a group of people that are all working around these kind of areas. In fact, in the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department, we are organized in something called the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines that's led by Tommy Poggio. This is an NSF-funded center to fuel work in this general area. It's one of the most interesting areas of our students and our grad students coming to work within our department. It's one of the brands that we have here in the department. It's funded by the NSF, at least for another five years. And what its future is going to look like from that is something that we're hopeful on, but we're not sure yet. Um, we have partnerships through the center. It's not just in our department, of course, as I mentioned earlier, especially computer science, artificial intelligence, media lab, and engineering that form the kind of interactions that the center is the nucleus for within the department. So um, with that, I would like to thank you. And I think we may have time for a few questions. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, so I think we have about five minutes for questions. Yes, so um, please. I'm just wondering uh, what the difference is in the architecture of the uh, deep, uh, uh, deep neural network uh, approach versus the, uh, uh, the, the system that IBM has built for uh, various strategy games. Um, for various strategy games. So I'm not sure which IBM system you're referring to exactly, but. Um, Oh, so it both has the name Deep. deep. So you're, you're talking about the original. So IBM has been a real pioneer in kind of driving AI vision. So you probably, when I was a grad student, Deep, you won the chess challenge in 1998. That was when I was a grad student. Then won Jeopardy in, uh, I should know, 2008. Watson, right. So, so Watson has a lot of the, you know, Watson, my understanding, again, I don't know everything about what goes inside IBM. But one of the things they did was they set up challenge problems and that was really drove a lot of the research, let's solve Jeopardy, let's do this, right? And then a lot of engineers came and applied a lot of different techniques to make those systems work. And my understanding is, you know, Watson has some of the same things that you saw from these visual processing. In fact, some of those same ideas of deep neural networks are used for other things like natural language processing and so forth, right? So this is, these kind of core ideas about deep neural networks are imbued without, throughout that system, as well as other ideas from other aspects of AI that folks like Josh works on as well. So there's a mixture of things within those systems, right? And so, you know, none of these things, and this is kind of a lesson I think you should take. It's sort of, as I said, these models have been known before. It's not like there's one piece of secret sauce of you just do this and suddenly the world breaks open. Really, they're kind of combinations of getting all the bits in sort of a reasonable place. So that's true, we see, for the brain models. Um, and that those models have slowly started to get better and better from a combination of many different things that had to come together. And I think that's also how 
you know, maybe that's a little depressing because we like to think there was a, we, scientists like to use the word discover, like we discovered how to do great AI. But I think it's more of an incremental sticking to building models, making them match what you see in the brain that you gradually and gradually get closer to something that performs better. That's what I think it will look like. I find that quite exciting, but I don't expect, there wasn't one big breakthrough. There were many things that came together to make these systems run. So I hope that partially answers your question at least. I think I saw one in the back first, and then maybe I'll go here. Yeah, right back. Um, the overall uh, kind of process that was used there to um, kind of untangle how the um, object recognition system worked um, from you know recognizing what brain areas were important through functional imaging, and then you know taking apart the neural circuitry there and understanding at a biological level, and then building you know computational models is super exciting. Um, but I'm curious. How well do you think that will generalize to untangling systems like, as you mentioned, you know, language processing or memory or decision making? And what will the big roadblocks be um, in you know, generalizing it to those areas? Right, no, it's a great question. And I think one of the reasons this can work well is because, as I mentioned, we had more access to this system because we have things like monkey models. For things like language, that's not gonna apply in such a direct way. Um, so we hope, though, and so you know, you might imagine one way to go is if we can develop enough tools. And you mentioned Bob's talking about Ed Boyden and others. They're always trying to build new tools that someday we could actually make these measurements in human brains, and then the same process would apply. But our tools are what's limiting us a bit. As the more human-like we expect these things to be, the more we push the limits of what we can get. When I remember, I mentioned earlier on constraint data of what kind of constraint data. We can get some from the humans, but it tends to be a much weaker constraint data than we can get from an animal model. Um, so, but there are many things that animals still do. Social behaviors, Bob mentioned, there's sort of many things that are still relevant that, you know, even, you know, that, first of all, I don't want to say we can't make progress even with just behavioral data from humans and the measurements we can get and building models. And that's like the work that Josh and others are doing. You can do that. But this kind of idea of going even deeper to measure mechanisms, we can do that, especially in non-human primates, for areas like social behavior and others, and even to the genetic level, as Josh, as, as Bob mentioned, when we have these knockout models that, that he mentioned with Guaping's work, that we can study those, those kind of properties. But I, you know, what we hope as scientists is there are principles, even though I don't think you know, a, a monkey's gonna have all the social intelligence that we have, that there's something about its social behavior that we can still learn with that root that would then generalize up to a human in a way that's not, we can't yet see, but another way to put this is we don't even understand how a mouse works or how a monkey works. So, so that, there's lots of progress to be made in that domain. But there's also progress from the top of just building models with the human constraints that we have to try to see if we can build better systems. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know whether you know, AI, next AI will come out of brain and cognitive sciences. I'd like to believe that, that is, we're going to contribute as we have in the past. But I do know that work on AI is important to the, the department and that there's this two-way street, that those are hypotheses of how the brain might be working. And again, we're trying to contribute in one direction, but we know in the other direction it fuels all of our other missions that you heard about. So I, I'm hopeful that we will continue to impact, but I certainly know that that tight interplay is critical to our overall mission. So we're kind of trying to approach them both together. I'm sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but I hope it kind of covered the ground. Yeah, I think I saw one here. In the, on the deep learning piece, just real quick. Uh, so there have been neural networks for many, many, many years, right? Uh, and um, there were scoring algorithms to aggregate uh, information to try and make sense of it. But something happened where people realized they, they only went three layers deep. And then suddenly people realized, oh, maybe we go eight layers deep, it's better. But 10 years ago, nobody went eight layers deep because it didn't seem to do anything. Mm -hmm. So was there anything that came out of this that caused that to be? So um, what the, the, so okay, so there's a couple questions buried in there. So what, one of the things that accelerated these networks was just the ability of computing power available to actually train the networks, okay? Um, so that, that's one of the answers. And now people are actually running these networks, trying to go deeper and deeper, because they sort of thought, oh, I go deeper, it gets better. That turns out kind of it's sort of tapped out, right? So there's something still missing. I sort of alluded to something in our own levels. Like they, they're mostly feed forward. They don't have any feedback processes, right? So, so there's kind of qualitative things that are missing. So engineers are running with the obvious thing, like let's make it deeper. But that's, that's largely tapped out. In fact, I think I actually put, here's a slide if you want. This is kind of like, these are models of different depths of neural networks. And this is their ability to predict those responses I showed you and their ability to perform on recognition tasks. And even though they're able to, I'll skip that part. 
even though they're able to drive forward the performance a bit by going deeper, it turns out that they're starting to explain the brain worse, right? So they're sort of, I think of this as they're deviating from the anatomy more in search of performance, which they're gaining. But now they're not coming back to this question, driving our understanding of the brain, which is kind of what's on this axis, right? So, so again, you know, we like to think as we understand this more, we can kind of drive this back up. But you know, which, who's helping who is often hard to, to feed here, right? So really what you have is a community of people that are interested in both questions. And it's hard to predict which one will drive which, but working in that space is what's most exciting. That's why I mentioned the convergence between these fields. Yeah. So, so there's many things that drove those models, and nobody can point to them saying, oh, it didn't need brain science. Oh, it didn't need engineering. It needed all of those things, right? So I, that's my, you know, there's not one thing. I have a nice review on this if you'd like to read that. So one more question is with that. So the deep learning that you described here, you threw up all the pictures of cars and so forth, and the deep learning is about classifying information, yes, as opposed to? That's where, that's where it was originally, but you can do many more things with these networks as well. Okay, so could you, give, could you give examples of beyond classifying? Well, so a simple one is just being able to locate the, the location of an object or report its pose and its other latent variables. Like, so those are kind of other latent contents beyond the category of the object and the image. So, okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. Closely related. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. right. And and so what's happening now is people are using these networks as kind of a front end to other kinds of types of models. And and Josh Tenenbaum would happy to. Many of Josh's work is now benefiting from that front end. In some sense, you can think of this as the ventral stream is like being an advanced retina, like, oh, here's this greater processing, and now you can do more cognition now that you have good visual representations, right? Now, whether they should stick with the convolutional flavor and the same style. That's unclear. The brain starts to change. It's, you know, depending what circuits of the brain you think are involved, those are some of the forward going questions. I don't think you just keep going with those same ideas. So that was my point about the brain. We've only modeled one aspect of the brain. Exactly. So, so, okay, so yeah, so maybe we have Rachel, tell me when we're out of time. I don't know. We're supposed you to have end. 11. To 11. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. So we have a few more minutes. I'm sorry, I got two over here. Um, maybe I think I had you first. Yes, sir. I'm curious. Is the neural pattern generated by a particular object the same in every brain, or does it vary slightly? Uh, that's a really great question. <laughs> it does vary slightly. What does that mean? Tell us. Yeah, I kind of skipped over that because that's sort of a. Uh, <laughs> um, so we don't yet, so I didn't, one of the things I didn't tell you about those models is the models produce population patterns, but the models don't say, oh, this is neuron 12, go look at neuron 12 in the monkey. The models produce a population, like a feature set, we call it, right? It's like a basis of the world. And then what we do is we take the model's features and we have the brain's features and we say, is there a linear map between them? Okay, and that's how we ask. When I did those predictions, I hid the step from you that we actually had to do a linear map to explain that because I didn't want to bore you with the details. Um, but so then that raises the question of like, is your brain and my brain in IT, are we linear maps of each other? Are we copies of each other? Nobody really knows the answer to that question yet. It's something we're starting to look at in the monkeys. We know, we're pretty sure we're probably going to be, you know, partially at least a linear map, but how much of a linear map and how much we share and how, what our differences are become interesting too. Like, how do you see differently than I see? And, and uh, that's, my belief is that we probably are some in common, but not completely in common. And quantifying that is something we're trying to do with the non-human primates, in part to know whether the models are doing the best they possibly could. I can't expect the model to predict all monkeys, it should be like within the space of linear mappable monkeys or within the space of linear mappable humans. So that's why that's an important question to us. But it really is an open one at the moment, but one that we're able to attack. And we just don't know yet the answer. I think I had maybe one more that there, and then maybe we have time here. Yeah, go ahead. Related to this question, how do we assure ourselves that, or you can assure yourselves, that the endeavor to build models to predict the behavior of our brain is accurately representing what our brains are doing rather than just making a parallel system? Yeah, that's, a, that's another great question. So I, I kind of skipped through that. I did show a few slides is that we don't, what you could say, what aspect of the brain should we even bother to model? Like, because we could take it down and model all the levels of detail. What I tried to say in my talk is that we had already known that when we looked at IT cortex patterns and we read them out in a particular way, we could predict whether the animal would say, I saw a dog, I saw a car. So that's a functionalist approach to explaining the system, right? I don't need to know, I can't read the animal's mind in this sort of deep kind of philosophical sense, but I can say, oh, the animal thinks it's a car, it's a dog based on its reporting pattern. 
So we built up models of how you, what aspects of the neural activity give rise to those to accurately predict that. And then we said, now that we know that, let's explain that. No more than that, that's what we want to try to model. So that's how we try to attempt to not go off and just we model everything, but just model the aspects that are tied to behavior. And that's kind of that's what I tried to say at the beginning. Like, start with the goals of what you think the interesting behavioral questions are. Work your way into the system. Find the levels that are mapping to that. And then make see if you can build models of that. Not everything, but just focus on those aspects. So that's what we did here. And again, we haven't modeled everything. I don't want you to walk away saying, oh, we understand everything. There's been a lot of advances, but there's a lot more work to do exactly along the lines of the, the last two questions that you, you gentlemen both just asked. I think we have maybe time for one more. Um, yes. I was just daydreaming about the possibility of finding dyslexic monkeys. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you found some monkeys that did poorly on your recognition tasks, and if you gave them that adaptation test that showed the difference, whether, whether you could find and eventually perhaps breed a population of dyslexic monkeys. Yeah, I think so. So as yeah, I, I think these are. I, I'm an. You saw my talk. I'm an MD PhD, right? So I hope that our work will somehow influence the human condition. But we start, we just didn't know anything about how the system worked at all. And when I started this work, I, and I, I said, well, and we didn't have the tools to kind of ask those kind of questions. I mean, we can only use, we don't have large numbers of animals we can devote to these studies. But now you hear there's this effort that Bob mentioned, the marmoset effort, where we can have many more animals and can control their genetics, right, that Gua Ping Feng is leading. So my hope is that there's a, enough of the primatology community around here that Many of us can start working on those kind of species where those questions will be easier to ask about individual differences, things like dyslexia and how, what their genetic ties might be. And so we're, we're kind of forming the behavioral foundation. Some of my, one of my postdocs is actually training marmosets on the same, kind of same tasks you saw that would set us up to be in the position to answer those kind of questions. But it were probably going to happen better in the marmosets because of the genetic control. There is genetic control possible in the rhesus monkey, but it's much more challenging, certainly in the US. Some of it's going on in China. But, but we're hoping that, again, the bridges be built. Humans, I mentioned humans, we walk it into rhesus monkeys, and then maybe we step it down to marmosets and try to keep maintaining those. And kind of keeping those connections is how we know anything we learn at the lower levels of the system actually applies all the way back up to the humans for a condition like dyslexia. And that is kind of the essence of the department. And I hope you saw in my work how we reflect one part of that bridge, but I need my colleagues to build all those other bridges. I think with that, maybe we should take a break. And I thank you for your time. <laughs>